All right, hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is October 19th, 2024, and today we're going to spend some time just going through revelations we've understood, showing, showing connections to other things that reveal this year. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show things that we have understood, but even make it more clear to you with uh, an understanding of somebody's birthday. Um, and just spend some time in these things. One of the things that I'm going to get into, well, the first thing I'm going to share is just very briefly as we get going, is something in relation to uh, Arcturus again that we've been talking about recently, specifically with uh, booties or boothies that um, relates to herdsmen. And it's something that a sister shared with me that she found with her mother in a Bible study. And I thought it was really, really cool. And and uh, and what it said about a write up about it. And then we've got our brother Jimmy, uh, who does our website, our incredible, beautiful website that he maintains and designed for us. And he does all of our thumbnails as well. So you saw the the thumbnail for this one. He had actually had that one designed partly in advance because uh, I was going to use it for this one because you're going to see a theme that kind of gets into this in relation to the representation of the menorah, in relation to what it's designed with, something we talked about years ago, but I'm doing it in relation to something that our brother Jimmy shared in the forum, and we we probably touched on it in the past, but you're going to see, like, in relation to this last teaching, this, this big, the, the, the connection that is revealed in Luke that goes from the beginning of creation, revealed in the book of Genesis, and right through to the end of days. So, and it relates to this picture of the menorah. So again, that was something that our brother Jimmy shared uh, in the forum as well. And then from there, I'm going to go into a piece, um, into a part that again, we talked on it, but it was a long time ago. And I want to show the clarity of this, because within this question that was asked by our brother Brian, is and it was something he'd asked me i believe it was privately like just doesn't have to be private but in uh, a private message um which was in relation to the timing of christ from the was or or from the is compared to what's coming in the is to come so for those that don't know what i'm talking about the was is and is to come pre mid post luke mark matthew spirit son father it's always in threes like this but what happens is from creation to christ is the was from christ until the moment of the pre-trib, we're living in the is. And from the moment of the pre-trib until the end is the is to come. And so um, this, this question in relation to the is of what Christ did compared to the is to come of what's going to happen when Christ comes, um, I'm going to show this, this clarity in it that will also give us another confirmation of this season and time this not i shouldn't say necessarily the season and time but the year to show the the overarching counts of the years that shows that when this happens in the future in the later portion of tribulation its connection is to the count as it was when christ came the first time you'll see when we get there and so you'll notice this theme as well that this this conversation that we're having tonight is from things that people have shared so our one of our sisters as i said rachel uh who had done a bible study with her mother was the story with amos we had brian that had asked me this question and who also shared this thing in the forum today or last night maybe about uh somebody's birthday and so i'm going to use that and show something that happened with him in the last 24 hours as well and then, of course, something that our brother Jimmy had shared. And, of course, there's one more, which is our brother Moses, who uh, who came across an awesome, I loved it, because this is one of the, the mysteries in Scripture that really shouldn't be a mystery. It's just the precision in reading. Okay? Now, this, I've talked about it in the past, you know, and for me, um, it, it's hilarious it's always been one of the funniest things between my wife and I because me understanding a comma before the word and or no comma, I mean, it meant nothing to me. I mean, 
absolutely nothing. I, I'm not good enough in, in English, the language of my birth, to, to pay attention to whatever it meant. It just was there or it wasn't there. And, and what it meant and, and what it means prophetically, what it means to understanding Scripture is, is night and day. Without the understanding, everybody thinks this piece, this portion that we'll get into means just the same thing. And we can show that it doesn't. And that is connected to the question that Brian had asked me as well. So you'll see in relation to uh, what Moses had shared, based on what he had found in one of his feeds, and he posted it in the forum because he thought, how fitting based on what we've taught on. Uh, and I, I thought it was awesome. So I wanted to share that. So you notice this theme that it's things that have been posted in the forum, things that brothers and sisters have posted, shared, asked, that we're going to be going into tonight and just showing where these things tie in, how they're connected, what it reveals, what deeper can we go into it. So if anybody is interested and you want to join the Ministry Revealed Forum, you can go to right here, ministryrevealed.com. When you click on there, you can go to the menu. In the menu, you'll see the link that says Forum. You can click on there. It takes about 5, 10 seconds to sign up. It's free of charge, no charge ever for anything. And we have about close to 1,300 brothers and sisters from all over the world in there, like-minded brothers and sisters seeking and searching, diligently searching the Lord, digging and diving deep into these revelations that have been taking place for seven years. It's absolutely awesome. Uh, news and events going on around the world in this crazy time that we could see we're at the, at the precipice of just at this doorstep of the end coming to begin, the beginning of the end, if you will. And, uh, you know, and prayer requests and, and all sorts of things going on in there. So if you'd like, you can come join us in there as well. Uh, the other thing I always say is if you're new to the ministry, and I won't spend a lot of time in it today, but if you're new in the ministry, this is the other place we always recommend everybody to come. This playlist link right here on YouTube and come to these first four videos. You can also go to ministryrevealed.com and in the menu box, click intro and watch the first four videos out of all of them that are listed. Watch the first four. Same with out of the 12 here. It'll take you to this channel, uh, to this Hi guys, right here. It's Lee oh, might as well let Jay. this keep going. Uh-oh. And I'm Melissa. There we go. Uh, we're and actually here at our the, Airbnb. The first four and... videos. Here we well, go. We're... So the first four videos right here. And what you're going to see is if you've ever had questions or, or questioned when reading scripture to try to understand why are there differences within the gospels like when you go to matthew compared to mark compared to luke and you see that it's the same story the the same thing that had taken place but some of the wording is different sometimes it's extremely different if you've ever wondered what that was and maybe you've just heard pastors say well it's just perspective and you've accepted it i'm here to tell you that it's impossible for all of it to have just been perspective because some of them are completely, completely different one from the other. And what you're going to come to understand is that those differences are prophetic revelation to the end of days. It is absolutely mind-blowing. And we have revealed it in dozens and dozens and dozens of places throughout Scripture. And every time we do, from the Synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it reveals the revelation of the end of days that starts with Luke, then goes to Mark, then goes to Matthew. It's absolutely incredible, and it'll be worth every moment of your time. This first one right here is only a 22-minute intro to give you some insight as to what the next three are going to be about. The th second one is a 30-minute Bible study of what I was just talking to you about, of some of these differences within the Gospels that will blow your mind just in 30 minutes. We've got three-hour-long teachings on many of these as well. The next thing that it does is you're going to realize once you see and understand who Matthew, Mark, Luke, the first will be last, the last will be first, when you realize that Luke, Mark, Matthew is how it plays out in the end of days, you will realize that the end of days isn't a seven-year period of time, but it is a 14-year period of time and a period for Luke called above. This period of time in relation to the pre-trib that happens and then Luke's discourse before seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets take place. The reason that this comes to be revealed, and most people think it's, it's absolute lunacy, is one, 
because they haven't first started with the understanding of who the Gospels are speaking to that reveals the revelation of the end of days. And to understand why and how it was all missed, it's the fourth teaching right here. About two hours and 43 minutes. I promise it's worth all of your time. Study it, pray over it, ask the Spirit to lead you in it. It will blow your mind. I used to think that it was, you know, maybe the, the pastors in the churches, they were hiding these things. No, I, I come to realize that maybe something like that is going on possibly, but the reality is it wasn't meant to be revealed till the time of the end. Till this, this period, which started even with us about seven years ago. I don't know why we were chosen, why it's come through this ministry. We've talked about that many times over the years. But it, it, it's, it becomes um, unequivocally understood to be true because we've been doing it for seven years. For seven years, from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation, proving out that these things revealed in here are all true. Every time we find something new, it reveals the exact place where that same conversation type takes place somewhere else that's talking about the exact same time. Over and over and over again. And that's why you see this, the, the thumbnail today, and as I was talking about with the menorah, because you see how you're going to see later on how the menorah is set up with with seven uh, uh, all, uh, almond blossoms, seven almond blossoms, seven almond blossoms, seven almond blossoms and one. That is the ultimate what we call big picture of the end of days. Now, not only is it the big picture of the end of days, it's the big picture of all of creation. It's seven, 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 one. All of creation, it'll be 22,000. All of tribulation, there's seven easy years where the bride is being prepared in a, in a way like never before. Then you've got your seven years of seals. Then you've got your seven years of trumpets. And when that seven is over, it's the final jubilee, the millennial reign. You see? It's incredible when you understand and see how it works. And you'll begin to understand it in these four teachings right here. And then you can go on further to, to understand more that pre, mid, and post are all true. That's why people can point to it in Scripture. But nobody could ever really understand how it plays out over seven years. Because it doesn't. It plays out over 14 in a period called above. You'll see the discourse is understood as never before. The timing and who the white horse rider is. The seven churches of the end of days prophetically revealed. It's absolutely incredible. And then as I was talking about a little bit earlier, this thing with the comma and, see, we've got a, a more, I think this is a more recent teaching. No, this is an older one that we did about the comma and, as I was mentioning to you earlier, that we will touch on here tonight in making a point about something about the Lord as well. And how it reveals the same year time frame, the same number, if you will, as it did 2,000 years ago. All right? So, with that, <clears throat> if you're new, come check those out. And if you've been around for a bit, <coughs> excuse me, well, let's get into it. As you know, my trusted coffee. All right. So, without spending a lot of time in this, because, you know, we've been doing this now since a little bit before August, right? <clears throat> Looking at this time of August. We've understood now what that difference was, which was continuing the count of that two months with a beginning in Taurus, but not from dark moon, but from the month beginning in full moon. We've talked about it quite a bit over the last couple of months or so. And all of that has revealed this timing right here. This timing right here as the beginning of the end of days. That this timing right here is the pre-trib and the beginning of what is revealed in that portion I told you that's called above <coughs> is the revelation of the 50 days before the 14 years begin. This right here is what we've been watching for now for the pre-trib bride of Christ. We understood that there was a period of time related to, to a remnant group, but that it would be observed at the year's end. Well, we were looking at many things of the year's end throughout, you know, from August to this point. And the reason, as I've said recently a lot, is the reason we've been so adamantly looking at these things 
is because of the understanding of the 70th year. I would not have continued to look past September, going into October, late October, in a belief that the pre-trib could possibly be at hand <clears throat> if it wasn't for the revelation of the true understanding of the 70-year count. And we'll touch on that today too because it's connected in this count, in this visual that I'm going to give you in relation to somebody's birthday. This is what we're looking for. If you're on the eastern side of the world, the 25th. If you're on the western side of the world, we're looking at the 24th. The pre-trib, bride of Christ, and the beginning of the 50 days. What do we know happens after that? The Lord is coming as the Son of Man, October 31st to November 1st, again, in an evening to evening, if you will, as the eighth day from the escape, when the Lord is coming as the Son of Man. He is going to be rejected. You're gonna, you're gonna, you'll remember some of these things because this is something we're going to get into when we talk about uh, what Jimmy was sharing, sharing of what we know from Luke chapter 17. When we see here, we'll talk about it more in detail and show where it reveals these things just in this conversation right here. Because this conversation is an end of days conversation. They're asking the Lord, when will the kingdom come? When is this period of time? And he says, he's explaining the end in Luke 17, 24, when he comes as lightning. But in verse 25, and we'll get to this more in detail later. He says, but first. And when he comes, but first, it says that he's going to suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. He is talking about the prophetic end of days, the final generation of that 70th year. This is what he's talking about. We know this. You see this all throughout Scripture, especially in the New Testament. This generation, this generation. When you understand that the things of Jonah, that the church will have told you that Jesus already fulfilled as Jonah, he did not yet fulfill them. And we'll actually be partially touching on that. Not fully. I mean, if you've been around for a while, you already understand. But it's the same thing when he says of this generation. It's talking about this prophetic final generation. But what does it say? That he's going to be rejected. Right? He's going to be rejected. He's not coming in the clouds or on the clouds, you know, he's not coming, uh, um, you know, as lightning at this point. He's coming as the son of man in the darkness to shed his light. And the world is going to reject him. Oh, sure, there will be some. But overall, the world is going to be rejecting him. He'll be here for 40 days. When the 40 days are over, there's three more days. And then it'll be the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And then the 14 years start. And it'll start with the red horse rider. We know what happens at the pre-trib. Iran will attack, and those with Iran will attack Haifa and Tel Aviv. Then it'll settle after that. One week it'll last for a Middle East war until the Son of Man comes. Not because he's done anything specific, but it'll only last a week because they're going to try to de-escalate after that major escalation, which I'm going to talk about another major escalation here later on too. And then, of course, once the 50 days are over, the anointing of what we call Acts 2.0 takes place. Then the 14 years begin at the Red Horse Rider. And when it begins, that will begin the attack on Jerusalem. And the Jews will be scattered. Many more will have died. That will be the, the big attack. That will be the official beginning of World War III. And the 14 years of tribulation. So you guys understand that. We've talked on it much, quite a lot lately. <clears throat> and so that was just for a little recap. So now let's go into this. Remember this with, uh, with uh, Boothies that we were talking about. We, we talked about uh, quite a bit over the last uh, three or four videos about this uh, Boothies and the, and the brightest star in it, which is the largest star in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, the, the brightest star in the Northern Hemisphere. And, and its purpose and its meaning and, and, and how it's connected to Yeshua, to Jesus. Because this is even the eighth day when he's coming at the time of Halloween. When he's coming as the Son of Man. When he's coming to shine his light in the darkness. And when this happens on Halloween, 
It's the time when Arcturus rises and sets at the same place, same time as the sun did at the summer solstice, right? During the summer. And it was very, very telling because not only did we need a year's end and beginning for the time of the pre-trib, but there was also one that was like a rising and a setting as the sun when the son of man would come as he comes out of his chamber as a bridegroom ready to run his race. And Boothies and that star was representative of it. And of course, Boothies is, I mean, uh, uh, Arcturus, uh, Arcturus is in scripture as well. So remember I said our sister Rachel had shared about it, right? We, we spoke about it uh, with uh, Arcturus, which is the brightest star in, in Boothies. And what our sister found <clears throat> was in a Bible study with her mother was in the book of Amos. The word herdman is used <clears throat> one time in scripture. So here we were talking about Boothies and, and it being the herdsman and the brightest star in it being Arcturus and its timing when the son of man comes as a strong man ready to run a race after he had his one week wedding with the Gentile bride in heaven <clears throat> and he's returning on the eighth day to begin his 40 days. Well, look what else was interesting, guys. 7.14. Come on. How many times does this type of thing have to happen? 7.14. You, you saw the menorah, right? You saw the thumbnail. 7.14.21 and the last Jubilee 22. Right? 7.14. And here we have like a picture of Right, like a seven, then seven is done, and then you got 14 years. And here we have a conversation of a herdman, and Amos is what? He's like a, a prophetic type of Christ. Look at what this write-up says about it. This is what our, our sister found, Rachel, in a Bible study with her, with her mother. So here is F.B. Mayer's uh, Through the Bible Commentary. Listen to what this says. The king's mowings, this is about Amos... Uh, chapter 7, the king's mowings were the earliest yield of the grasslands which were exacted by him. Our king also has his mowings, which he takes to himself, our dearest and best, while the dew is still, while the dew of youth is still upon them, but he is only claiming his own. Now, what do we know about this? It's talking about the dew of youth, almost like, you know, as if he was taking his children, like that, like little infants or, or uh, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, those who were uh, uh, aborted and things like that. But that's not what we're seeing here. We know that there's a connection to Boothies, to a herdsman, which is connected every year at this time on October 31st. And when he comes on October 31st, after the seven-day wedding, who's he coming to meet? Who's he coming to gather to himself here? It's not the pre-trib. They're already gone. It's the remnant bride, the remnant workers, the Smyrna group, the, the Luke 24 group, that, that remnant group that will remain while the wedding is taking place and will be receiving the Lord when he comes as the Son of Man, for which he will have that meal after, the banquet meal after the wedding. This group that we talk about so much, that Smyrna group that will serve him during tribulation, and then for putting their necks on the line for, for all of these things and bringing in the great multitude, they will take part with him in his kingdom, sitting with him in his throne as he sits in his father's throne with him. They will rule and reign with them as kings and priests during the millennial reign. These are the ones who will be in the first resurrection. <clears throat> and theirs is to rule and reign with them. Who is he coming to gather? Who is he? Who are these early mowings, if you will, that are being spoken about here? It's the ones he's claiming as his own. And this commentary, as you know, has nothing to do with me. Or sister Rachel, I don't know, if, sorry if I said Kathy earlier, uh, our, our sister Rachel who found it. It's a commentary that was written probably decades ago. 
and the commentary is exactly in line with the timing of when he's coming in Boothies as Arcturus, and he's the herdsman coming. I thought that was a pretty cool share. So now let's go into what I just touched on a little bit ago. Watch what comes about. So this is what our, our brother Jimmy had posted about in the forum. Uh, Luke 17. Luke 17 is another one of our, you know, <laughs> I, dare I say again, favorite places, you know. There's so many. I say it all the time. All of the word of the Lord is my favorite, right? The, he is the word. Jesus is the word of God. He spoke only what the Father gave him to speak. So everything that we have here is him, and it's from the Father. He is the Word. So, of course, it's all exciting. And when you understand it more clearly, especially if you've been seeking to understand prophecy for a long time, these things will blow your mind once you understand them. But that's why I always tell everybody to start in that intro series, right? So look at what happens. We've shared on this many times, right? But just to prove out what we talked about in part of the last teaching in relation to going, the last one or second last one, in relation to the Gospel of John to the first 21 chapters of Genesis. John, John's 21 chapters and the 21 chapters of Genesis tie together. They play a prophetic picture in what we call chapters to years. The 21 chapters in John's gospel play out as events laid out with them as prophetic pictures of events that will play out in those years in relation to the end of days. For those that don't know what I'm talking about, if you're new, let me show you a picture. Here it is right here. John has 21 chapters, and within it will play out the 21 years of the end of days. But the first seven, as I said earlier, this is where the bride is being prepared since the fall of 2017 the bride is being prepared okay the spirit those who are in christ spirit filled and then what happens well then when tribulation begins you see the events from john chapter 8 that are a typology of what will play out you go to for example john chapter 4 and you see <clears throat> that he said he was coming to receive them unto himself when he returns He's coming back with paradise to receive them unto himself. And when is he doing that? At the great multitude mid-trib rapture in the seventh year of seals. And it's talked about in John chapter 14. In John chapter 21, you see that Jesus says, now this is the third time I am come to you, right? This, this is the third time he shows himself to his disciples. And there's a whole conversation in it as well. Like I said in the last one where we talk about the 153, where we've got a teaching on it. That shows it relates to the resurrection of the just, those that will take part in the first resurrection. Well, you can do the same thing within Genesis. Like in chapter 14, well, chapter 7 to 8, again, we'll touch on it. That's it's the story of the ark with Moses, I mean with, uh, with uh, Noah. And then you have chapter 14, Melchizedek shows up. And then you go to chapter 21, and Isaac is born. It's all of this timing, because what's this timing of Isaac? The beginning of the 21st year, or in the end of days of seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets, it's the Lord returning feet down on the Mount of Olives in the 14th year, which in the big picture is, of course, the 21. So this is what our brother Jimmy was sharing. We know this is the end, right? He says in 27.14, for as lightning lighteth out of one part out of heaven and shineth unto the other part of heaven, so shall the Son of Man be in his day. Well, we can prove, and we'll show it later, that this is when he's returning feet down. Of course, he, of course he's talking about coming as lightning from one end unto the, of heaven unto the other, and everybody will see him in his day singular. But in verse 25, he says, But first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. And... So when he's coming in this but first, what does he relate it to? He says, and as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the Son of Man. Wasn't that interesting? This isn't the same conversation of Matthew's. Matthew chapter 24, days of Noah, is completely different 
than what Luke is talking about here and what Jesus is mentioning here. The one, as we know in Matthew, is the final 14th year of tribulation. This is talking about when he comes as the Son of Man for the 40 days as we were talking about earlier. And what does he relate it to? He relates it to these days of Noah when he comes in his days, when he's going to be rejected first. He's talking about when he's coming for 40 days in relation to the 40 days of Noah. And how do you know? Listen to what it says. And they did eat, they drank, they married wives and were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. So what happens if we go into Genesis and we go to the first 21 chapters, we should be able to go from the chapter 7 and maybe even a little into chapter 8. But really, because we're in the seventh year right now, we're in that seventh year. We're in that final period end time of that seventh year in the Shemitah cycle, which is also the true end of the 70th year coming up. And we're going to explain it and make it very visual for you guys. So what do we see in Genesis chapter 7? Remember, if it's seven years and then 14 and then 21, and then 22nd is the Jubilee in the beginning of the millennial reign, then what do we see from what he said in Luke? Ah, they got in the ark and the flood was 40 days. So we've got the story of when the floods came, they now were in the ark. They were marrying and given in marriage until the flood came and lifted up the ark. And here it is. So you have the story of Luke chapter 17 in the but first being revealed in Genesis chapter 7. And everything is what? 7, 14, 21, and then 22, the final jubilee. So let's see what Luke says next. Let's see if there's anything else before we go back to the very end, which is lightning from one end unto the other. Then he says in verse 28 of Luke 17, likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted and built. But the, the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained down fire and brimstone. Okay, uh, it rained down fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Huh. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot. So we had him saying, but first, the first portion I'm coming has a relation to it when I'm going to be rejected as Noah's. And it relates to the 40 days. And in Genesis 7, boom, 40 days relates to Noah when the flood starts. What's the next one? It's talking about Lot. They bought and sold. And it's talking about Lot. Let's go to Genesis and let's see if we go to chapter 14 and see if we go to chapter 14 and see anything about Lot. Oh, Abraham rescues Lot. <laughs> Funny how that worked, right? Funny how that worked. Genesis 14, 12, and they took Lot, Abraham's brother's son, uh, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. We go a little bit further and we find out that Abraham had these trained servants in Genesis 14, 14. And when Abraham heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 300 and uh, 18 <coughs> and pursued them unto Dan. What did he have? Trained servants. So what are we talking about? We're talking about, see, 14. In the big picture or the seventh year of seals, we go right across to Genesis. There we are. So we found seven. Now we're in 14. We know that the Lord is coming on heavenly Mount Zion. And look what happens. Look what happens to see if there's a group of trained servants that, like Abraham, are suddenly going to be brought up. Watch this. If we go to Revelation chapter, uh, Revelation chapter 6, what do we see? At the end of the sixth seal, which is the end of the sixth year, just as the seventh year of seal. See, from the end of the sixth 
just as the seventh year of seals is about to start, this same picture we're talking about in 14, we see that the world is in panic, hiding in the rocks and in the mountains, saying, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? We've talked about what this is. This is the Lord coming with heavenly Mount Zion. He's coming with paradise as John chapter 14, the place prepared that he said he would go and prepare a place, and when he returns, he will receive them unto himself. This is going to be a wild sight, man. We've talked about it recently, and it gets it gets heavy it gets deep and it gets wild as to what it is that they're seeing coming. But what if we go to Revelation 7, which equals right here, the seventh year of seals or the 14 in the big picture to connect what we're talking about in Genesis. So not only is it Lot's time, so those like Lot, there's the rescue, right? Lot is rescued by Abraham and Here's the seventh year of seals, the time of the great multitude rapture. But is Lot rescued quite yet? No, Lot had been taken, right? Just like during seals. When the church, those who come to Christ, those who are going to be taken, some will be killed, right? Some will make it. And in that 14 big picture or seventh year of seals, we see that Abraham is going to have a group trained up. So what if we go to chapter 7 of Revelation and... Look who shows up. A group trained up. A group trained up who are sealed by the Lord that were before the throne. Revelation chapter 7 literally has the same typology picture as the time of Genesis chapter 14 when Abraham is going to go to rescue them with a group of trained servants. Chapter 7, check. Chapter 14, check. 7 easy, 7 of seals, and then there's 7 of trumpets, right? And so here's, again, here's the story of Lot. We see in Genesis 14, 16, and he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. And look who's here. Melchizedek, high priest and king. Jesus is now on the scene. You see how crazy that is? Here is Melchizedek. When Melchizedek is here, what do we know from Psalms 110? When Melchizedek shows up at this exact same timing of the seventh year of seals, he's going to sit on the right hand of the Father, and it says he's going to rule out of Zion and rule in the midst of his enemies. Right? We've shared on this recently. He is now going to be high priest and king. Well, what did what did Luke chapter 17 say at this at this timing of Lot and this coming in of Lot and this rescue of Lot, which represents the church, those who were asleep? What does it say? In verse 30 of Luke 17, it says, even thus shall it be in the day when the son of man is revealed. You mean when everybody's screaming and looking up, terrified to see what's coming? You want to see another another insight into it? In Luke 17, 29, it says, uh, uh, actually in uh, 1728, about Lot's time, it says they bought, see that? G59 and sold. G4453. So 59 and 4453. If we go to Revelation, Chapter 13, which is when the beast comes into power, which is at mid seals, approximately about two and a half years into the 14 years, when he receives his 42 months to continue, which is to the end of the sixth year of seals. When this three and a half year period, that 42 months takes place in that second portion of the first seven years. When he has to be worshipped, what are they going to have to do? Remember what it says? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? It says right here. So in verse 16, Revelation 13, 16, and he causeth all 
both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in, which, by the way, means on, just so you know, means on. Maybe it's going to be in, but the definition of the word means on. Uh, on their foreheads or on their right hand, and that no man might buy G59 or sell G4453. See that? Save he that has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. We know that this is all seals. We've taught this portion of time being about two and a half years when World War III is settled by the beast rising and taking his power when you'll get that power to continue for 42 months to the end of the sixth year of seals. And then the Lord comes and destroys him and he no longer is for a period of time. He's going to be in hell, right? Not in the lake of fire yet, but he's going to be in hell. So we're seeing this exact conversation in this little snippet from the Gospel of Luke and why it's important is because it reveals the understanding of the above and the 14 years. It reveals the understanding of Luke, Mark, Matthew, the discourses within them. It shows that it's seven years, but in the first seven easy, there's a little snippet of above that's left, and then you've got seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets. We just saw how it equaled that conversation of the 40 days of Noah in chapter 7. We just saw how Lot and, and the buying and selling, which is the equivalent of the mark of the beast time, buying and selling. And then he's going to be rescued. And when he's rescued, then it will be at this time when the Son of Man is revealed. Well, this is only to the end of the sixth year of seals at that time of the seventh year of seals. And this brought us, right as we saw, <clears throat> into the seventh year of tribulation or the seventh year of seals. And in the big picture, Genesis chapter 14. Well, what does it say next? Well, if we go back to where it starts, which is verse 24, he said, For as lightning that lighteth out of one part under heaven and shineth unto the other part of heaven, so shall it also be, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. So he's telling you what? The end at the beginning. He then tells you what the beginning will be first. So which means if this is when he comes after the pre, when he comes for his 40 days as Noah's, and then he's gone after those 40 days, having been rejected, and then he's coming again at, at the same typology of Lot, at Lot's rescue, when a group is trained up to go in and get them, which is the 144,000 who are going to help the Smyrna remnant group who were with the Lord for 40 days and then served him during seals, they're going to need help which is the 144,000 that will help rescue the lot type, which is the church and the greatest revival in human history that will have happened in the midst of the worst time to this point in human history. To the point where then comes the Son of Man at the end of the sixth to start the seventh. See how that works? It's right there. Not only is it here in Luke 17, but it's revealed in order of 7, 14, and, oh, what about 21? Doesn't the Lord return? Is there something of the Lord coming at the beginning of the seventh year of trumpet judgments? Or at the end of 13 to begin the 14th year of tribulation? Right? Well, let's go have a look. We see that Genesis chapter 21. What is he saying? He says that it's going to be as lightning from one end unto the other, okay? So it's a picture of the coming of the Son of Man, the coming of our Lord and Savior returning to the earth when now the whole world will see him as lightning. <coughs> and what happens if we go to Genesis chapter 21? The birth of Isaac. The birth of Isaac the literal prophetic picture of Christ showing up on the scene is the prophetic picture 
from Genesis 21, the what? The promise. The promise. Hello. Wasn't, a, wasn't Isaac the promise that God gave Abraham? And where does he show up? In chapter 21. Do you want to know what's wild too? To add even more awesomeness to show how Luke was talking 7, then talking 14, and when he said it first, or, or when he said as lightning from one end to the other, he was starting here, then said but first, then said this, and then it takes it to when he's coming as lightning from one end to the other. You want to know what makes it even more wild? Is that even though this is the revelation of the big picture of 21, and then the Jubilee will be the 22nd year, the real story of the end of days is the period called above, and then seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets. You know, people wouldn't say that this has been tribulation that we're in. Okay? It's not the tribulation as the first seven easy years. It's not the tribulation as we would classify tribulation. Okay? It definitely isn't. Because it's been the time of waking up the bride. Of preparing those in Christ spirit-filled. You see, what are these final three sevens? It's the, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven times seven, right? For a jubilee count. And when the seven times seven is over, that's the end of 49 years, then you have the jubilee. The reason we don't talk about these is because that's just, that's just life. It's, it's been life and it's been like that for almost 2,000 years. It's the final three, but the first of the three is less quote unquote noticeably impactful, if you will. And then the last two sevens are the crazy times of seals and trumpets. So when we say 15th year is the Jubilee, it's because of the seven of seals, seven of trumpets, and then 15th year is the Jubilee. When we say 22 years is the Jubilee, it's because we've included it from the easy seven years from when everything is getting prepared and it equals the 22nd year is the Jubilee. But the big picture, the overall reality of counting it is that it was seven times seven Shemitahs, right? Seven years. And that would be 49 and this would be the 50th year. Okay? And that's what it equals. But <clears throat> now watch this. Where... Where Isaac shows up, and he's now on the scene, is directly related to the timing that we're talking about of when Christ comes as lightning from one end unto the other. But in the story of Genesis, remember, we're looking, the, the, the real stuff we're looking for is the seven years of seals, seven years of trumpets, okay? There's seven years of seals, seven years of trumpets, but to the end of the 13th year, It'll be 13 years of tribulation, and then there's one more. But this final 14th year <coughs> excuse me, begins with the Son of Man himself here, having come as lightning from one end unto the other. He's going to deal with all of the enemies against his people and against Jerusalem in that final 14th year, which, as we've taught on in the past, is the Matthew 24 days of Noah. It doesn't relate to the 40-day picture up here like Luke 17. It relates in Matthew 24 days of Noah to the final 14th year, the entirety of the final 14th year. <clears throat> so why is that important? Because of the storyline, <clears throat> sorry, sorry, but because of the storyline in Genesis chapter 21 is directly related to the storyline of 13 years and then the 14th year. Let me show you. Genesis chapter 16, Abraham has a child with Hagar, and his name is Ishmael, okay? The, the Muslim side, or the Arabs. <coughs> He's a wild man, right? He's against his neighbors, hello. There's a reason this has been going on forever with them. And how old was Abraham when he had Ishmael? He was 86 years old. Go to chapter 17. Now Abraham is 99 years old and God makes a covenant between him and his family. And what we find out is that not only is Abraham 99, but Ishmael is 13 years old. 
So what do we have? From 86, Ishmael is born, to the end of 13 years, God makes a covenant. When Ishmael is 13, and Abraham is now 99. And then what happens? Well, then you follow the story into chapter 21, and you see that Isaac is born. And when Isaac is born, how old is Abraham? 100 years old. What is that? The 14th year. You see how wild that is? You see how impossible it is for anybody to, to connect these things without the importance of the revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to that reveal the true end of days. Did you see that? 7 from 17, 14 from Luke 17, 21 from Luke 17, and in the final, as lightning from one end to the other, is the revelation of the 13 years and then the 14th year when the Lord returns. Crazy, right? Well, it doesn't end there, of course, because we do that in these other books that we have chapters to years. And what do we know about the 14th year of the return of the Lord feet down on the Mount of Olives? Oh, wait a second. In Zechariah's 14 chapters, here is chapter 14 when the Lord returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. When he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives, obviously, we know that that's the 14th year, right? We know it's the 14th year. He's starting the 14th year. And what is that in the discourses? Well, it brings us to Matthew's discourse. Luke's discourse is the above. Mark's discourse is the seven of seals. And Matthew's discourse is the seven of trumpets. So let's see if we can connect what Luke was telling us in chapter 17 about what it would be like when he returns feet down as lightning from one end unto the other to start that final 14th year. Well, do you think it's there? Matthew 24, 27. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Immediately after the tribulation those days. Here's, this is the picture of the Lord coming at the end at that, or the start of that 14th year as Zechariah 14, when he, as Luke 17, when he said, this is what it'll be like at his coming. But then he said, but first, this is now at his coming to begin that final 14th year or the seventh year of trumpets. And what is that final year? It's at his coming. And what are we told? The day and hour no one knows, and that it would be as it was in the days of Noah. Luke's discourse doesn't talk about it. Mark's discourse doesn't talk about it. Only Matthew's discourse talks about it. And the reason why is because the final 14th year, or the big picture 21st year, is the 49th year, the final 7th year, in the 7 times 7 of the Jubilee, and that final year, is one year and 10 days long the exact amount of time that the days of Noah were. The 40 days start on the second month, 17th day in history, right, in the was, and when it's over, it's over on the second month, 27th day in chapter 8. Isn't that wild? Because only in a 49th year, in a jubilee count of seven times seven, only in a 49th year is that year one year and 10 days long because on the 10th day, the day of atonement is when they sound the shofar of the jubilee. Just awesomeness. Absolutely <clears throat> all there for us in what? Uh, six verses, seven verses. Isn't that wild? It's the kind of stuff that just puts you in awe. It just has you like, what? What? Watch this. In fact, let me let me finish that thought in relation to what I was saying about the story of the ark. Look what happens, okay? 
a jubilee year is the seven times seven years for 49 years. And then it says, then shall thou cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the 10th day of the seventh month. The 10th day. Well, the end of days, we're not talking about the house of Israel that goes from spring to spring. We're talking about the house of Judah that goes from fall to fall. Right? From the fall times to the fall times. And so, 10 days from fall to fall is trumpets to trumpets, feast to trumpets to feast to trumpets, and 10 days later is atonement. It's the story of the final year as it was in the days of Noah. And it's the shofar that gets blown for that final jubilee. Now, look what happens <clears throat> when we look at the menorah. Just like the picture. These are the almond blossoms on the menorah. You have one, okay? Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two. Uh, sorry, twenty-one, and then twenty-two stands on its own. It is the revelation of the end of days. Seven easy years, seven years of seals, seven years of trumpets, and the final jubilee in the menorah revealed in the gospels in the mystery of the gospels right there before our eyes another incredible mystery and just mind-blowing how these things it i can't even explain how most of these things came about it's just the spirit leading you know we've said that a lot of, a lot over the years <clears throat> nothing here has been dreams or visions or anything like that there hasn't been any audibles, nothing. With the exception of one confirmation, as you guys know from the Holy Ghost, that was about uh, being right on target that revealed Taurus. And we know what that importance has been. That We've talked about it quite a bit lately. But everything else has been diligently studying the word, and then all of a sudden, things just connecting, things clicking, and, and they're understood. I've talked about it a lot over the years. Uh, you know, like I said, when it comes as the thing we're going to talk about later with the comma and the word and compared to not having a comma and not having the word and <clears throat> you just it, 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 it I, I've never understood that. I'm not some English major to to know and to understand these things. I never comprehended it. It made no difference to me. But something happened as I started reading a little over seven years ago and poof. These things just opened. I would read the scriptures, and I knew where they connected. It was the craziest thing. Many of you who have been around for a while know the story. I can't explain it. I was freaking out. I was in tears sometimes twice, three times a week in the first year or so because I, I, I couldn't understand it. It was freaking me out. And one of the things in relation to this, another one is like going to Luke in chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, as we've explained. What do we know about Luke 1, 2, 3, 4? We have a teaching called Luke in order. It's mind-bending. You see prophetic mysteries revealed within the four chapters that reveal a portion related to a pre-trib group and a remnant like John the Baptist. And at the end of those, his birth and the connection to the circumcision, the eighth day, then you go into Luke chapter 2, and you have the 40 days of the Son of Man connected to his birth, which is a picture of what we were just talking about when Jesus comes for 40 days as the white horse rider in that portion called above that we were just talking about for Luke 17 as it was in the days of Noah, or, or uh, as the days of Noah. Well, then what happens? Well, then we know when the Lord comes at the end of the sixth year of seals. When he comes at the end of the six year seals, the prophetic picture within Luke chapter four is that picture of him at the end of the six year seals laid within it. And I'm not going to go into all of it because we've taught on these things. And there's a great video that talks about Luke in order one, two, three, four. And then we get to Luke chapter four and Luke chapter four is a picture of what? There's the pre and the seven day wedding to the eighth day. Then you've got the 40 days of the Son of Man. Then you've got him coming at the end of six years to that seventh year of seals. And then you've got him coming when he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. 
And what do we know happens? He'll be tempted by Satan. Satan was given everything in the kingdom in this moment of time. Right? And then we track it down. We know that Satan is defeated. He's now gone for a while, which is a picture prophetically of him being gone for the millennial reign. And the Lord is glorified by all. And what did we see him now talk about? He then reads from the book of Isaiah, chapter 61, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord, and he closed the book, saying it was now fulfilled in their ears this day. Well, if it's connected to this same time frame, when the Lord's coming, and then he defeats Satan in this 21 or, or end of days picture of the 14th year, when he's going to defeat Satan, defeat the beast and the false prophet, they're going to be cast into the lake of fire. It'll be the treading of the grapes. And then Satan is bound for a thousand years. What happens when that's over? In that same picture of Luke chapter 4. Then he, he what did Jesus do? <clears throat> he declared Isaiah 61. But in Jesus' day, in the is of when Jesus did it, he didn't complete the verse. And the reason he didn't complete the verse is because it wasn't the end yet. It wasn't that final year that was to be fulfilled in the is to come, in that final year of the year and 10 days as the days of Noah. So that's what he was doing. He was proclaiming Isaiah 61 2 to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then it says, and he closed the book. You see, but in the end of days, in that final 14th year, big picture 21st year, it's the days of the vengeance of God. And when that year of vengeance is over, meaning he will have declared that it has now taken place, where this is now, the book is closed, as he says, what happens? He's declaring the jubilee to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening to prisons of them that were bound which is exactly what again leviticus chapter 25 when the seven times seven 49 years is done seven times seven when the 49th year is over after he's destroyed the enemies after he's bound satan after the the prophetic type of of uh, um luke chapter four in Luke, in order, it's the declaration now of the Jubilee, the final year. Just as it said takes place when it's the proclamation of liberty and the returning of all to their portions. It's awesome. It's so awesome. It's so wild to, to track these things through, to be able to show them to you and to break them down. And you know what's so exciting about this? I mean, it seems obvious for those who have been around for a while. But for me, it's part of it's part of the greatest joys that I have. Because I know you guys are getting it too. I didn't I didn't I wasn't the one that brought this up in relation to Luke 17 and how it related to what we were talking about recently with Genesis. Did I know of it? Have we talked about it in part and piece? Sure. But Jimmy was the one that went in and saw 7 and 14 and 21. And then the final being 22 for the Jubilee. We know this is the picture. It is the revelation of the end of days. And it is the picture of the menorah. I, I didn't tell him. He studied it. And he understood it in studying it because of what he learned and studied in all the revelation here. Just like everybody else here is doing. Just like, um, excuse me, just like our sister did in relation to, with Rachel, in relation to uh, Arcturus and Booties, the herdsman. Just like our brother Moses did when he's posted this picture for us to see that we'll, we'll talk about in a bit as well. Just like in Brian's question and then something Brian posted and how it triggers something for us to go and look and to show connections to. It's awesome. It's so exciting. It's so much fun. And I said it, I say it all the time. This when I when I'm just not quite feeling it, if you will, my my greatest joy is teaching. 
I love this. I can't believe every time I do a teaching, I still can't believe I'm doing what I'm doing. And knowing and understanding what I'm knowing and understanding. It blows my mind every time I ponder it. And I, I'm just so thankful. I am so grateful. I'm honored. I, I, I'm not deserving. None of us are. Because it, it's not just for me. That's why I do it online. It's for everybody. I can't lead a single one of you. The spirit has to lead you. Hello. It's so exciting, right? Well, now, remember we were talking about this from all the way back with the story here beginning in Luke chapter 17. Well, now, when I showed you this, I showed you how Luke 17 showed us in relation to it starting like the 40 days related to the Son of Man. And in relation to Jimmy Share, how it went 7, 14, 21, and then we know the Jubilee is the 22nd. The 22nd year overall. And from that, we shared that in this final 21st, 49th year, or 14th year, that it's when the Lord returns, feet down on the Mount of Olives, and that final year is the year as Noah's, again, going back to the story of Noah, but relates to the final year as one year in 10 days. Well, do you know there's still another story within the story of, of, uh, uh, of the ark and the story of Noah? So not only was it the 40-day picture that starts it all, not only was it the final 14th year picture of one year and 10 days and then the Jubilee announcement, within the story of Noah is the revelation of everything I'm telling you right now, what we call the big picture. Look at what it has. In verse 4, Genesis 7, for yet seven days, and then in verse 10, and it came to pass after seven days. So this yet seven days and after seven days, they're the same seven days, okay? So you've got one set of seven days, okay? And then we'll go to chapter eight. So what are these seven days tracking as? They're like a picture of these first seven easy years, okay? And then within this very end, you've got this 50-day commentary. <clears throat> And when it's over, what do we have? Seven more, which relates to seals, and seven more, which relates to trumpets. So you've got seven years, seven years, and seven years. And then, of course, the final 22nd. Well, in Noah's story, they're not years, right? That first seven, for yet seven and after seven, those are days, right? And that represents the first seven. Some people might say, well, wait, those are days. You're talking about years. Well, for those that haven't understood this before, this is what prophecy tells us. The day-year principle or year-for-a-day principle is a method of interpreting Bible prophecy in which the word day in prophecy is considered to be symbolic of a year of actual time. Did I write this? No. This was known and around before I was born. I didn't make it up. Yet, we can show you the picture of 777 as days being years for the end of days. We just saw in chapter 7, the first 7. Look what happens when we come <coughs> Excuse me, to chapter 8. The 40 days come to an end. The raven and the dove are sent out. And look at what it says next. Genesis uh, 8, verse 10, and in verse 12. <clears throat> it said, and he stayed yet. So this is the dove. And he stayed yet seven other days. So what do we have? Well, chapter 7 said yet seven. And then after those seven. And then chapter 8, I think it was verse 10, said, then he stayed yet seven more days days is what prophetically we're talking prophetic prophetically as years days as years and then what does it say in that seventh year relating to those first seven days as years it said then the dove came in at evening and low in her mouth when because the, the dove had gone out again right 
she comes in with an olive branch or an olive leaf plucked off. What's the word for plucked? You guys know that the word plucked is the Greek word harpazo, which is rapture, and the great multitude rapture happens in the seventh year of seals. Look at all of what? People say, oh, it says leaf. No, it also means branch. Hello. But then it gets better because just as we saw, there's that seven where the rapture takes place. We saw he's coming on Mount Zion with paradise. We see that he's gathering him in John to the place that he had prepared to receive them unto himself, that where he is. And we see that it's exactly the one connected to the great multitude rapture in the seventh year of seals, which is when the high priest and king Melchizedek comes and Abraham is the one with his trained group that goes out to fight to rescue them, which is the 144 from Revelation 7 that then rescues, helps rescue with the first worker group, the great multitude rapture. It's in the story of the ark. Isn't that crazy? But then there's still one more seven though, isn't there? We still got one more seven to go. Oh, there is one more seven. Genesis 8, verse 12. And he stayed yet seven other days and sent forth the dove, which did not return unto him anymore. Why would the dove not return anymore? Because everything is over. The Lord is on the earth. The spirit is roaming and free. It's the, it's the final seventh year. Days as years. And you want to know what's crazy? This was such an awesome find. I can't remember if, if, if I had discovered or if somebody else said it was years ago that somebody may have pointed it out. I don't recall. But watch this. When the first seven years or days in the story of the ark take place or at the end of it, just in relation to the context of it, does it tell us anything about, you know, maybe tribulation or, you know, this is when the craziness begins? No, it just says, for yet seven days, I will cause it to rain on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. It's interesting, right? Because we've shared on this in the past that this seven days can be days as the seven-day wedding, right? And then when the seven-day wedding is over, those seven days have come to pass, then the 40 days of Noah start. That's exactly the prophetic talk that we've been showing, showing of the end of days, right? That the first seven days is the wedding and the Lord returns on the eighth day, which is a picture like he said in Luke when he comes, it would be as it was for the 40 days of Noah. Isn't that wild? But what you don't see is any specific wording that talks tribulation-wise. So when these first seven are over and then we get to the next seven starting, look at what it says about them in the story of the ark. This is why when you have a program like this called ESORD, you'll notice that these are all the Strong's Concordance. So you could really dig into the words, find their meanings, right? Noah's name means rest, quiet. Well, if you were just reading from your Bible your whole life, you would always just, you're, you're kind of still in milk once you understand word definitions and you can go and study and seek out their meanings and track and trace them now you're getting into some meat and this is a great example of it here's now remember stayed yet seven other days this is a picture of the seven days as the seven years of seals this is the seven days as seven years of trumpets it started with a seven then has another seven then has another seven Huh. Seven, seven, seven. Easy seals, trumpets. Look at what the second seven tells us about it. The word stayed is 2342. This word stayed for the beginning of trumpet judgments is 3176. But it's the same phrase. And he stayed yet seven other days. And he stayed yet seven other days. But the word definitions are different. Remember what I showed you just a moment ago? In relation to the word, it said the word um, in the right hand or in the forehead. And the word actually means on. 
That's a big deal. Same if you go to, as we said, and you'll see in the intro of the differences in the Gospels and who they're speaking to, in Luke's Gospel, in his discourse, when the Son of Man is coming for 40 days, it says that he's coming um, in a cloud, singular, and it means in. In Mark, it says he's coming in the clouds, plural, and it means in. But when you go to Matthew 24, when we know he's coming as lightning from one end to the other, the word in the clouds when he's coming in Matthew's gospel in 24, he's not coming in the clouds. That word is actually defined as on. It's the same type of thing going on here. Why they didn't use the more appropriate words, I don't know. That's why having a Strong's Concordance is going to multiply your understanding by at least tenfold, if not a hundred, the longer you do it. So watch this. The seven years of trumpets is literally just wait and be patient. But look at what the 14 years begins with. Remember, this is the start of the 14, seven and seven. Look at how it starts. You think it would be tribulation? Hello. Pain, pain, sorrow, pain, pain, pain. It's the tribulation beginning. We showed what the connection was. Remember to, uh, to Revelation chapter 12, verse 2? The 40 days, which is the 40 days of the Lord, which is the uh, um, uh, 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 in travail, but before the pain, and the pain equals the beginning of the 14 years in Revelation 12, 2. Here it is right here. What's the beginning of the 14 years? Pain. Bam. What does it have to do with the word stayed? I mean, you'd say, well, and he he pained yet seven more days. I mean, maybe some way of saying that could have been done, but it's the word stayed, but the word stayed means pain. What do we get here in the picture of Genesis 7 and 8? We get another picture within the story that not only is it Luke 17 and the first portion telling us that the Son of Man's 40 days will be as the 40 days of the ark. He then tells us that in Matthew 24, that final year when he comes on the clouds, it says, as lightning from one end to the other, it would be as it was in the days of Noah. Because if you go from chapter 7 into the end at chapter 8, you see that it's over. It starts on the second month, 17th day, and it ends on the second month, 27th day. And that's exactly to the end when a jubilee year takes place, only in the 49th year. And the shofar is blasted. And what is Matthew 24, the days of Noah? It's literally the final year when the Lord has come feet down which is the 49th year, and only the 49th year is one year plus 10 days for the blowing of the shofar. And now we can also prove, just like the entirety of the first 20, uh, 21 chapters of Genesis did, seven easy, seven of seals, to the end of seven of trumpets, showing us the entire picture of Luke 17, and then the story of the overall story of the ark showing us, Seven, seven, seven. Funny how that happens, right? And everybody thinks we're crazy. We don't know what we're talking about. How come we can keep doing this if it's not true? How come we could show it repeatedly in one set of scriptures, in one pile of 21 chapters? We can show it like half a dozen times, if not more. In one story, we can show it three. What? So awesome. So wild that is. These are the types of things that just, like I said, it just, oh my goodness. All right. Now, let me show you guys <clears throat> the clarity of this. This is what I was talking about that's going to relate also to a person. And this person it relates to will show you this clarity of what we've been talking about for the last few years. Uh, and specifically the last year and a half, two years for this 70th year. The 70th year is something I believe, as far as I know, I've said it before, as far as I know, we are the only ministry that even with the thousands of people around the world in this ministry that have that are listening to others and everything, nobody had continued to seek and search out the 70th year. Yet everywhere, 
in prophecy, it talks about 70 years. It is vitally important to understand. And if it's that important in Scripture, <coughs> as, we'll, as we'll touch on, excuse me, then why did everybody stop looking? All right? The reason everybody stopped looking is because in May of 1948, on May 14th of 1948, Israel became a nation. And what happened was until 2017, 20, or I guess 2018, everybody was talking about in that final year from the Revelation 12 sign in 2017, even until about that time in 2018, everybody, including us, was talking about the 70 years of Israel. And they were talking about it with a whole bunch of different places in Scripture because everywhere it tells us about 70 years. And it came and went. And everybody stopped talking about it. We diligently, diligently pulling out our hair trying to figure out where it was. And the answer to where is it one, it has to be in Scripture, but two, it will never be proven until the time begins. Hello. It won't be fully known, <coughs> excuse me, until everything starts. But everything should be in the Word of God. Everything should be given to us in Scripture. The only thing is, how do we discern it? How do we understand it? Where do we look? If they came in on May 14th, 1948, my wife wasn't born in 1948, but pretty wild that my wife's birthday, of all dates, my wife's birthday is May 14th. Pretty wild, right? For me, of all people. that's I thought that was pretty interesting. But they came in in 1948. Obviously, 70 years came to an end. And... In May of 49, uh, uh, sorry, of uh, 2018, and nothing happened. And we continued, we diligently saw it, we, we found a connection to, uh, uh, I think it was Luke chapter 13, <clears throat> but it wasn't quite there. But there was an association with it, and a, one of our brothers, Samuel, found uh, Leviticus 19. We were still green in some of the, the, the Old Testament beginning in the law. And now that's no longer the case. But back then, and he had discovered that Leviticus 19 gave us another, this mysterious kind of insight. And, you know, if I probably jumped the gun, obviously, in, in understanding it because I was eager like many. Could you imagine if, I, if this had been understood to us years in advance, could you imagine what would have happened if, let's say, for example, we knew three years ago that it wasn't going to be until about sometime in the fall of 2024? Could you imagine what we'd be doing right now? Would you have, consid would you have continued to diligently seek and search out the Lord in these mysteries with me? Would I have continued as diligently as I have week after week after week after week nonstop? I, I don't know if I would have. You know, in our in our hum, in our humanness, in our fleshly ways, <clears throat> we might have just said, "Well, heck, if we know it's not till about the fall of 2024, well, then I'll come back in summer of 2024." You see, that's because the purpose, as I say all the time, is not about the when. The when it will happen is the cherry on top. We have diligently sought it as we have diligently sought the scriptures. But the story is the revelation of Christ himself in his revelation. Like I said at the beginning, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. He is the word. Every word he spoke, every word from him is from the Father. And we've been given the understanding of that revelation to the extent that we've been given. It's way more about the when, right? I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's way more than about what the when is when, about when the when is. But like I said, it's the cherry on top. And 
when you understand what we understand, <clears throat> that it's connected to everything starting at the end of 70 years, and we can show and count and calculate and prove that this is the end of 70 years coming up this fall, sometime in this range, in the fall of 2024, this is why we've continue, continued to seek it out. But as you can see, it's not all we're doing. Even look at the last teaching, man. It was awesome. We now understand the, the story in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Revealed, understood. And look what we just went through <clears throat> in this first portion. It's awesome. But now what about this 70th? Even though I know you guys know it. I know you understand it. I'm going to give you a, a much more clear visual, if you will. They came into the land in May of 1948. Scripture tells us in Leviticus 19.23, And when you shall come into the land, <coughs> excuse me, May 1948, and shall have planted all manner of trees. Well, when they came in in 1948, they didn't plant all manner of trees. They didn't plant all manner of trees until February 14th, 1949, at the new year of trees. So they didn't plant all these trees until the following February. So they came into the land, but it also says, comma, and, meaning a separate thing, but in addition to, shall have planted all manner of trees for food, then shall thou count the fruit thereof uncircumcised, meaning the land is not yet yours to take from. He's telling them, <coughs> excuse me, it's not theirs yet. You're in the land. Now you've planted the trees. But it's not yet yours. But <coughs> then he says, three years shall it be uncircumcised. Okay? That means not, not for them, not theirs. Okay? Uncircumcised. They are the circumcised. So it's not theirs yet. So three years it shall be uncircumcised unto you. Um, it shall not be eaten of. Okay? Now, when we see when they came into the land in 1948, is that where the count begins? No. Because it says they also need to have planted all trees. <clears throat> Excuse me. They didn't plant all trees in that symbolic literal date until February 14th of 1949. <coughs> Excuse me. But what do we know about those people, the people living in Israel? They are not the house of Israel. They are the house of Judah. This is why, you know, there's so many debates and it drives me crazy now. You know, once you understand something, it, it, you you still keep hearing it. It tends to drive you crazy. You just want to share it. <clears throat> but unfortunately, so few people listen. Because it's not a replacement theology. There's the house of Israel and there's the house of Judah. The church is the house of Israel. It's it's the world and, and the church, the Gentiles, grafted in with the house of Israel. The house of Judah are the Jews and they're the ones in the land. Remember, Abraham, the Lord told Abraham, your, your descendants will be as numerous as the stars, right? As the sand of the sea. Well, there's only, what, 14, 15 million Jews on the earth. That's not, that's not sand of the sea. You see? Because it's talking about the house of Israel in that case. And that's connected to the great multitude rapture in the seventh year of seals. <clears throat> but when they came into the land, who came into the land? Judah. The house of Judah came into the land because nobody knows who the house of Israel is anymore because they're scattered everywhere. So this is a conversation here to when Judah, the house of Judah, came back into the land. They came into the land in 1948, planted in February of 1949, but they are not the house of Israel. They're the house of Judah. And you guys know about this. We've shared on this, right? The number of the kings, <clears throat> the way the kings are to be counted which threw everybody's counts off for centuries. You would count one king 
and it could be 19 in another way it would be 21 years in another calculation within scripture and it would throw all of these counts off by one year or two years on one side or the other and for the longest time people use this as criticism to show that it wasn't god inspired writings because all of this counts of the kings were off compared to what scripture said until these guys discovered it i think one discovered it yeah the first book written in 1951 <clears throat> and then this guy teal wrote it uh i think in the i might be wrong 80s or 90s or something like that and it became much more uh widely received and understood so what is this story he explained that this pattern that throws off an error of one or two years on either side it says it explained this pattern as a result of two different methods of uh reckoning regnal years the accession method in one and non-accession so the accession year method in one <coughs> and non-accession year method in another those who have been around for a while you know exactly what i'm talking about what you come to find out is we'll keep reading it says under the accession year method if a king died in the middle of a year the period to the end of that year so he died in the middle of the year there's still in half a half the year to go it says the period to the end of that year would be called the accession year of the new king which means that remaining half a year that the new king took over in he is not officially in his first year his first year isn't beginning to count it's just considered his accession year and then it says under the non-accession year method the period to the end of that year so the same scenario the king dies halfway through the other half of that year it says of the year would be year one of the new king and year two would begin at the start of that year <clears throat> so what that means is where a session took the 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 remaining portion of that year when the first king died and this other king took over there's six months left in the year it was called a session and then when his time starts that's now the beginning of his first year and the other half was just the accession. In the non-accession format, the king would take over from the other one in the midst of the year, and those six months would be called his first year. And when it got to the new year, they would now say that that began his second year of his reign. So you end up seeing how that could really, really throw off the, the, the counts of the kings in scripture. And then what you find out as it says uh israel so the house of israel is the one that used non-accession okay and the house of judah used the accession method now listen to this in addition theo also concluded that israel counted years starting from the spring or in nisan well while, while judah counted the years starting in the autumn of tishri so not only is there a difference between accession and non-accession in how the kings began their reign, but the house of Israel, which used um, non-accession and whatever the months were between kings, that would be his first year. And then when his second year officially begins, it would start in the spring at, the, at Nisan, at true Nisan, okay, at month one. But if it was the house of Judah, then whatever that, that, that period between the king's death and the other king taken over, that wouldn't be called year one. And it would become year one at the fall beginning of the year, not at the spring beginning of the year like the house of Israel did. You see how twisted that would be in trying to figure out the count of the kings to track during scripts throughout scripture and that's why you had people this is why it's so powerful because you had people for centuries that would criticize and you criticize the scriptures and use that as a thing to point to to say see the scriptures are fought are fouled they're corrupted <clears throat> this is not the word of god 
he can't even count his own kings crop correct uh, uh, properly throughout his house of israel and house of judah it wasn't until this was discovered and then started to spread that it became understood and now nobody could say anything about it hello what have people been using for centuries against the scriptures? The differences in the Gospels. The differences in the Gospels people have been using to discredit scripture to say, look at what this Gospel says, compare to this Gospel, compare to this Gospel, and there is no way you could tell me that that's just a, a point of view or a perspective. It's clearly one thing being spoken of differently than the other. Sound familiar? It's the same story of what they were doing with before accession and non-accession. It's what everybody's been doing, saying, and even trying to attack us that it's not true because they haven't taken the time to see that it is true. That the revelation of the Gospels is the same type of typology of picture of what these guys went through. And when it finally got the light of day and started being taught in the seminaries, there was nobody now able to dispute it. Well, we're, these, we're the early years of this. We're only seven years into it. You see? But it's the same story. People everywhere try to point to these differences in the scriptures to say, see, they're corrupted. They're not the true word of God. He couldn't even keep his gospels in order. And we could prove yes in court. Of course he can. Not only can he, he did. And we can prove what it means. See how powerful that is? That's, that's the same picture of what this was until these guys discovered it. But do you notice what happens? The house of Judah had the accession and didn't begin until, <coughs> excuse me, the fall feast time, until the time of fall. So do you know what happened? They came in in 1948. Leviticus said, you also had to plant all manner of trees. Well, they also had their elections in January of 1949 when Ben-Gurion won. And Ben-Gurion, there's pictures of him at the planting of trees in February of 1949. Well, Ben-Gurion as prime minister is a type of what? King of the house of Judah. The house of Judah even though he became king over here or prime minister in modern days, he's the house of Judah. And they do what? A session. A session. The house of Judah historically did a session, which means not until fall, fall, whether it's whether the Hebrew calendar is correct or not, not until the time of, we'll just use the season of fall, does the count begin? Did I make anything up? No. I followed what Scripture reveals that these guys have revealed in the counting of the kings. We know in our reality, Judah is the one in the land. We know from Leviticus that when they came into the land, they had to plant. Well, they also had to have a voted in uh, an actual king, right? Or their prime minister. And they're the house of Judah, which means their count doesn't begin till the fall time of 1949. So, if we take 1949 in fall, so I'm just taking October 31st just for a number I'm choosing. October 31st of 1949, and you add 75 years, you get October 31st, 2024. What is the 75th year? So if this was the date, for example, let's say it was this date and this was the date, just for example, that would mean 75 years is over. It's completed on October 31st. On October 30th, it's 74 years and 364 days, which means what? From day one, from, from October 31st, November 1st of 2023, you are day one, so you are 74 years and one day. That one day is the beginning of what? It's the beginning of the 75th year. The 75th year is over 
at the end of that year. Even though we would say, oh, he's going to be uh, 75. So all the time he's 75 years old, you're going to say he's 75, 75, 75. Actually, it will have completed 75 and be in the 76th. So what does Israel say right now? They count from 1948. They erred not having followed the scripture of Leviticus, not understanding the accession, non-accession. So they say, as of May of this year, that there's 76. You see? We can prove scripturally that they're not. Right? They're in their 75th, and their 75th year comes to an end in the fall of 2024. Let me show you a great example of this. <clears throat> Benjamin Netanyahu. This was shared by our brother Brian in the forum, I think it was earlier today. Benjamin Netanyahu was born in 1949, okay? 1949, uh, October 21st. This was Benjamin Netanyahu's birthday, okay? What are we talking about? We could have used the example, instead of me saying October 31st, I could have just used Benjamin Netanyahu's birthday two days from now, okay? So in two days from now, Ben, it'll be Benjamin Netanyahu's birthday. He was born in the fall of 49. What did the revelation of this count tell us? That the count for the house of Judah began in the fall of 1949. Okay? So if it began in the fall of 1949, <clears throat> how old is Benjamin Netanyahu until his birthday? He's 74 years old, right? But he's what? In reality, he's in his 75th year, right? He's 70, he's 74 <clears throat> years old, 363 days old. Those 363 days are the 75th year. It's like when you're born until you're year one. All of those 365 days of the first days of your life, you're in your first year. And when you turn one, you've completed your first year, but everybody calls you one, even though you're in your second. We've talked about this a few times before. So he's 74, but he's in his 75th. And when he hits October 30, uh, October 21st, or like our picture of October 31st, he will have completed or be 75 years old. But this is to give you this picture to show you that the reality is we are in the 75th and it's between the turning of 74 and the completing of 75. Why is this important? Because what Leviticus tells us. When you come into the land and shall have planted all manner of trees, you can't take from it. It's not yours. The land, it's, none of it belongs to you yet. It's uncircumcised. You can't touch it for three years. Three years you can't take from it. But in the fourth year, all the fruit thereof shall be holy to praise the Lord with all. So in the fourth year, it belongs to God. It belongs to the Father in that fourth year. And then what does it say? And in the fifth year shall you eat the, free, the fruit thereof. So from in that fifth year forward, it's yours to eat, which means four and one. And in that one is what? The 70th. It's the beginning of the 70 years. So it means when the end of the true 4 and 5, right, completing that 75th, that, that 5th in the 70th, when that comes to an end, the 70 years are over. You understand what I'm saying? Just like Netanyahu. He's 74. What was it? 1, 2, 3, 4. You can't take from it. It's not yours. The, the, the land, none of it belongs to you. Your count began in the fall of 1949. For the first four years, it wasn't yours. Three, you can't take. Four is mine, says the father. And from the fifth year forward, it's yours. Which means four and then the 70. And at the end of 75 is the end of 70. Just like Netanyahu's birthday, except we're not saying it's that exact date. But the picture is the fall time frame from 1949. 
this is the unequivocal picture of the end of 70 years. <clears throat> Can't take from it three years. Fourth year is mine. And in the fifth year, what are we right now? We are in the fifth year plus that fifth year began their 70 years. So he's in it. They're in it. They're literally in the 70th year right now until sometime this fall when the 70th year ends. There is no other scriptural biblical count that lays this out for us like this. Nothing. <clears throat> Nothing. It's the end of it. And look at how clear Netanyahu's is for us, his birthday. You understand the Leviticus count? It's exactly this. The four and 70, and that 70th is in the fifth year. Like from that count of in the fifth, now it's yours. Just like his birth in the fall of 1949. So for those who are having a difficult picture are trying to visualize it and saying, well, 75, you know, does 75 begin last year? No. You are in. He was in his 75th year from October 22nd of 2023. And he will have completed that fifth or 70 and fifth year on October 21st, 2024. It's not difficult to track. But talk about visually seeing it crystal clear and being able to understand it from Scripture and from Scripture. You don't think we're close? Do you guys see what happened to Netanyahu today? Did you hear about that? The assassination attempt? Where a drone, they, there was an, a, a, an attack by a drone on his house? <clears throat> Some people might say, Oh, I, I could hear it already, right? We get a lot of different uh, 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 responses in the forum. Whether it was Iran or it wasn't Iran, it doesn't matter. Whether it was Israelis that did it on purpose to give themselves a reason to go and strike while the international community is coming against them to get them to stop, to settle this down. Maybe Netanyahu purposed this so that he can... He can have people turn to him and say, look, look what they did to me. Now I'm no way I'm going after them no matter what. Maybe that's the case, but it doesn't matter. Do you know why it doesn't matter? Because he's going to do it anyways. He's going after them. And we know he's going to go after Iran. Guys, you need to understand something. For those that haven't understood it, Ishmael. Ishmael is the wild man, okay? Ishmael, the Arabs, they hate the Jews. It goes back thousands and thousands of years. It's purposed. It says he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man and every man's hand against him. Hello. That's what's going on. Ishmael against Isaac. That's the whole story of what's going on, right? What is it, uh, Jacob and Esau? It's the whole story of what's going on. And Jacob's, Jacob's portion is going to try to bring it about because they want to bring an end to it. Well, that means whether this was Jacob or Esau, Ishmael or Isaacs, it doesn't matter. Why doesn't it matter? Because it's coming anyways. The 70 years is almost over. The 70 years, 5 and 70, is almost over. It equals this fall. Whether you want to say it's the Jews' feast for which we're looking at the year's end to the, to the new beginning, or whether you want to understand it as we've revealed it, from a Lord God count perspective, which was that he begins in Taurus as it was in the beginning from the new moon, uh, from the full moon 
at the sun, at the solstice, as it was in the equinox back in the beginning, when you counted out this equals the fifth month, ninth day. The beginning of the 50 days starts with the pre-trib and takes us all the way into December, <coughs> into December until what would be Tishri 1, the fifth month, or sorry, the seventh, uh, uh, Kislev being the ninth month becomes the seventh month. Why? It's as we've been sharing, for those that have been around for a bit, it is the revelation confirmed by the Spirit that Taurus was the beginning. And in the end, it will be as it was in the beginning. Whoever finds the beginning finds the end. And that period equals it beginning right here. Okay? Now, remember, this, this all relates to 70. Well, why is 70 so important? Well, 70 is so important because as you guys have seen many, many times, this is, this is the number one piece of scripture, Psalms 90 and 10, to prove out the 70 years. But the days of our years are three score and 10, that's 70. And if by reason of strength, they be four score, four score years, that's 80. That means from 70 to 80 years. Okay, that means 70 is complete. Well, what is 70 complete? Well, the five were at the beginning, right? The four into the fifth, and then the 70 years, because in that fifth year, it's theirs. Which means this is the 70th year right now. Right as we speak. And when it ends, Psalms 90 and 10, the end of days begins. And what does it say? From 70 to 80. Yet is your strength labor and sorrow. The word for labor and sorrow means tri uh, pain, travail, tribulation. So that's 10 years. And then it, is, then it says, for it is soon cut off. That means a short period of time, which I've explained many times and we can prove it's about six months. So you've got 10 years and about six months. And then it says, and we fly away. We know that this we fly away has nothing to do with the pre-trib. This is all about Revelation 12, 14, 10 and a half years into tribulation when they fly away on the wings of an eagle to the end of the 14th year. This group that flies away on the wings of an eagle from Revelation 12, 14, they don't return until the sounding of the shofar of the Jubilee and they will be brought back into the land and they will receive their portions of land back and the millennial reign will begin. So you've got 10 years, about six months, and the three and a half years that they fly away. This is the 14 years. When does it begin? When seven years is over. And then you got 10 and a half approximately until the cut off. Well, what about Daniel chapter 9? Daniel chapter 9, we see the same thing, right? Again, something we've shared on a number of times. Let's go to the e sword. In Daniel chapter 9, there is, from the was of Daniel 9, written about the is of when Christ came the first time in the story of Daniel 9, but it's also it also reveals the is to come, where you don't have to multiply the 70 of weeks of years and all that. They could be 70 weeks as years, just as it says, which means 70 what? Years. 70 Shabuas, right? 70 Feasts of Weeks, not multiples of seven, but 70 of them. So what do we see? 70. The story even relates from verse 2, when he understood that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And here he is talking about 70 weeks, which is Shabua, right? Which is the word for Feast of Weeks of years. So what do you have? 70 specifically of years. And then what does it say? Verse 25. Know therefore and understand from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem. Most people don't get what this is there for because they can only relate it to the is of what happened. You see? But in the end of days, it's because why? It's because Jerusalem is destroyed at the start of the 14 years. Hello. It starts with the destruction of Jerusalem, the 14 years that starts after the 50 days. 
So it says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks. Seven what? Years. If 70 is years, then from 70 years, you have what? Seven years, which represents seals. And then it says, comma, and, which means this is separate from this, but they're comma, and, they're to be added together. So you've got seven, and then you've got three score and two. So the two weeks is another two years. And you've got what? Three score, which is 60, which gives about a year and two months, right, of actual weeks. So you're at about three and a half years. But what happened during the first seven years of seals? The city and the streets never got rebuilt, right? We know only the foundation does, but what does it go on to say? It says during the three score and two weeks, the about three and a half years, which takes us to a total of about what? Ten and a half years approximately. It says during the about three and a half years, this the first half of trumpets, right? The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. After, specifically, see, <coughs> the three score in two weeks, which is the about three and a half years, the about first half of trumpets. Listen to this. It says Messiah shall be cut off. Seven and about three and a half. That's about ten and a half years. And then you have Messiah cut off. What did Psalms 90 and 10 tell us? Ten and about six months, right? A, a period of soon and then cut off. That's ten and a half years and then cut off. Another place we have, we were talking earlier about our chapters to years. Zechariah is a great one. We saw the Lord coming feet down on the Mount of Olives. Do you know what happens is if you go to Zechariah, Chapter 1, just like Daniel, we saw that it talks about the 70 years and then gives a breakdown. We come, we come to Zechariah chapter 1, and verse 12 talks about these 70 years, meaning here it is in the 70th year. And then look what happens when we go to chapter 11. Chapter 11 would be what? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So in the 11th year. So if we go to the chapters to years and we go to Zechariah chapter 11, Zechariah chapter 11 would be what? In the 11th year, in the 10th year, right? 10 years in the 11th year, which is about sometime in the midst of it, about 10 and a half years in. And what does it tell us? The vintage of old is cast down, right? It's come down. This is talk about when Satan is cast down. And we see that it says, um, in verse 10, and I took my staff, even beauty, and cut it asunder that I might break my covenant, which I had made with all people, and it was broken in that day. This is because of the people, as we said recently, right? It's not that the Lord breaks his covenant. It's because of what the people did that the covenant is now being broken. So what do we see? In the 11th year or in the 11th chapter is about 10 and a half years in. Again, 10 and a half years in. So if we go into this other chart, <clears throat> it would bring us to there's the end of 70 at some time in the fall of 2024 right which i believe it'd be on the lord god's calendar from taurus 50 days begins uh on the 24th to the 25th of october and that would bring us to the 11th year or 10 and a half years in okay what would this equal well it goes from the fall feast, right, or the, the fall time. So it would go fall to fall, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And then what? From the fall of 34 until spring of 2035 would be about ten and a half years, correct? About ten and a half years would be spring of 35 because this year starts in the fall of 2034, and it ends in the fall of 2034. So about the midst of it would be spring 
right? First or second trumpets, uh, uh, sorry, first or, or maybe second uh, uh, Passover, but relating to Passover, okay, would be a total of 10 and about six months, about 10 and a half years, and it would be of 2035. 2035. But when Christ came the first time, and you do this count of Daniel 9, and you do it, and people say, see, look, it equals when it happened with Christ in 33 AD. Well, that's because you're counting from the was, right, from BC, but there was no BC, remember that. You're counting in events that took place from the was, and you're counting it to find this date in the is to come. It's simply a number of years from when the count began. And that's how they could understand this year time frame when Christ showed up, right? And his death and resurrection. But in the is to come, how can we show it? Well, we have to understand the true understanding of 70 years. And then we have to understand the 14 years and how it breaks down as the seven, three and a half. Then when Messiah is cut off, there's two and a half years with the flood and the war. And then the final year when he confirms the covenant that was broken when he was cut off. And that's the this is the final year in Daniel 9, 27 that we were talking about earlier, that final 14th year when he comes as lightning from one end to the other. It's that final year right here. Now, we're talking about this Messiah cut off. And they, they were able to determine this later, of course, that in this count from the was to be able to determine this year time frame when Christ was going to come and that it would be the time they would later find out would be the time of his death and resurrection in the cutoff. For us, we know what it means prophetically at the end of 70 years. Then you've got seven years of seals. Then you've got about the first three and a half years of trumpets, which puts us in the 11th year, which is about 10 and a half years in when Messiah is going to be cut off. Now, we know it equals sometime in the spring of 2035. <clears throat> but watch this. The question that one of our brothers that Brian had asked me was, but Christ, his death and resurrection was 33 AD. And the sun, moon, and stars have proven it. History records, documents, and so forth, right? And we've, we've agreed with it. We can show that this is what it is. It was at Passover of 33 AD. So some people would like to say, so why isn't it that the cutoff for Messiah that we're talking about here in the is to come if we do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, it only looks like eight and a half, not ten and a half, right? Wouldn't it be 33 to equal 2,000 years later in, in the revelation of everything? It seems like it's off by two years, doesn't it? Exactly. Exactly. Of course it's two years off. Because the Gregorian calendar, brothers and sisters, the Gregorian calendar came in the 1500s. Prior to that, it was the Julian calendar from 46 BC. Watch what happens. Okay? Let's go have a look at this. We're missing. It, it appears to be off by a difference of two years. But the Gregorian calendar didn't exist until back in the 1500s. And so everything after that has this count based on from when that calendar started, but everything before it had to be, had to be quote unquote initialized, you know, line it up to those periods of time. But what else do we know, brothers and sisters? What else have we understood that we can prove with others that have toured the world showing it for decades? When was Christ born? Christ was born in 2 B.C. How many years difference between a Gregorian calendar telling us that Jesus was born in 1 A.D. when we know in a non-year zero Gregorian calendar count, 
Christ was born in 2 BC. How many years are missing? One, two, two years are missing. So to the actual count from his 2 BC birth, even though on a Gregorian calendar, because it starts at year one and does, and what is year one? They based year one as Jesus' birth, BC, AD, right? Before Christ, right? After death, before Christ, all that stuff, right? It relates to Jesus. And they say it was 1 AD. Well, those who study these things out know that it was 2 BC. The difference is two years. Well, guess what? If you added two years to 33 AD, what would you get? 35? But when we go to look at these things, when we go to look at these things in Stellarium, when we go to track these things back in history, every single history book record is equivalent, dated back to a Gregorian calendar year now. So when we go into Stellarium, it looks like it's 33 AD. It's the year 33 AD because everything has been accounted to a Gregorian calendar year that we're in now. But the reality is, it was off by two years from the birth of Christ, making 33, in reality, it would have been what? 35. And then the Gregorian calendar comes about, and we're counting now in the Gregorian years from that accordingly. And when is the cutoff of Messiah? 35, 20, 35. Funny how that works, isn't it? Funny how the exact equivalent lines up. The exact typology, the exact count is corrected and made up for right here. Now, the question is, you might say, well, what do you mean? Okay, we can see from, from Zechariah in the cutting off, we could see the cutoff in Daniel, 10 and a half years in that 11th year. We could see it from Psalms 90 and 10. But what do you mean Jesus, Messiah is cut off? Well, let me show you something. I haven't spoken on this in quite a while. If we go to Luke chapter, oops, Luke chapter 24, we actually get the true story of the death and resurrection of what took place when Christ came in the is. And here's what we see. In Luke chapter 24, verse 6 and 7, it says, He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how we spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, listen carefully, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, comma, and be crucified, comma, and the third day rise again. What did it say? It says he's going to rise on the third day. When is he going to rise on the third day? What is the third day? From when he was delivered into the hands of sinful men. When was he delivered into the hands of sinful men? On the evening of Passover, after he had the Passover meal. When was he crucified? During uh, uh, Passover, before the sunset, right? Because he had to be taken down because it was the Sabbath coming. So then he was what? Crucified. And now he was in the grave. And then he resurrected on the third day. That began from when he was taken into the hands of sinful men. It doesn't say, and then the third day rise again, like another three days later. No, it tells you that from the time he was delivered into the hands of sinful men and then was crucified and then was in the grave, he resurrected on the third day from when that began. We taught on this a while back. Christ was only in the grave for about one and a half days. The entire story of the third day rise again is a total of itself 
only two and a half days approximately, <clears throat> right? He had the Passover meal. Then he was taken and he was uh, um, brought before the courts. Then he was crucified during the day, right? In, in the afternoon, late, late morning afternoon. And he had to be taken down before the sun and he was put in the grave, which is the 15th day. And he resurrected in the daytime, in the morning of the 16th. Everybody knows this from the 14th to the 16th. <clears throat> and yet, everybody tries to go and tell you that he was in the grave for three days and three nights and resurrected on the fourth day. Impossible. Not even possible. How could it be that he resurrected on the third day if he was in the grave for three days and three nights? People will try to go to the Jews and the Jews will say any part of one day, even if it's one hour from one day and then one full day and then one hour from the next day, that's three days. Nope. Because Matthew's gospel says three days and three nights. Jesus was not in the grave for a full three days and three nights. The total from when he was delivered into the hands of sinful men and crucified, put in the grave, then rose on the third day, the total is two and a half, about two and a half days. He was only in the grave for about a day and a half. How long is this story? Two and a half days. Why do I bring it up? Because Messiah is going to be cut off. Remember, he shows up at the beginning of the seventh year of seals, at the very end of the sixth, and he's here for the seventh year of seals. <clears throat> the 144,000 are sealed, that, that remnant group of warriors trained up to go help bring in the great multitude. And then we see the seventh seal take place. He makes a covenant with all nations. And then what? Then you've got, the seven years of trumpets beginning. What happens during the first three and a half years of trumpets? The Messiah is here, right? They're on heavenly Mount Zion. Paradise is there. And the city streets and temple are being rebuilt during the first three and a half years of trumpets while the Messiah is here. Messiah, high priest and King Melchizedek. Just like we saw from Luke 17. That's when, when they, when, uh, and then shall he be revealed. He's there on Mount Zion. Everybody's freaking out. But then it says, in the is to come of Daniel, in Psalms 90 and 10, in Zechariah 11, and in many other places, he gets cut off. When is he cut off? In 2035, the equivalent to what, 20, uh, to what 33 was, because he was born in 2 BC, which is really the equivalent of 35. And in our time, it will be 2035. Do you understand that in a 2024 fall count, it's the only year it equals this. Hello. Remember what we were talking about in recent videos? That only this year for the next 30 years does the solstice at the sun in Taurus at the full moon happen? happens this year and doesn't happen again for another 30 years. And that count is as it was in the beginning. And it's the exact count to take that takes us to the 24th, 25th, beginning of the 50 days with the pre-trib of October. And then the Son of Man returning October 31st, November 1st, depending what side of the world you're on. That only happens once in the next 30 years. And I just showed you that the 70th year from a biblical count and a historical understanding of counting of the kings only happens this year, the 5 and 70, this year? The 70th year ends this year. There's no more option for it. And now on top of all of that, I just showed you that the difference of a 2 BC to 33 was the difference that actually tells you it would have been equivalent to 35 AD and from the Gregorian calendar's creation until now, it equals 2035, the year that Messiah would be cut off. 
Some people might say, well, shouldn't this be the 6,000th year then? Nope. And you know why? Watch this. We just talked about it a little earlier. Watch what happens. Remember this principle? Shared it earlier. The day for a year principle. The day for a year principle. Just like I went through with you in relation to the story of the ark with Noah. The seven days as years, seven days as years, seven days as years reveals the 21 years, the 777 we've been talking about to then the final jubilee, the 22nd year. It's, it's the picture of the menorah, 7771. Well, it's the same principle of a day to a year that applies here. Messiah was taken into the hands of sinful men or delivered into the hands of sinful men, crucified, put in the grave, and rose from the beginning of that count on the third day, which was a total of about two and a half days. Prophetically, the day-to-year principle would mean those two and a half days would prophetically be two and a half years. Hello. Would prophetically be two and a half years. Which means you have your half year and what? Two more. You have two and a half years. Two and a half years brings you to the end of what? 13 years and leaves one year. What did Daniel show us? What did Psalms 90 and 10 show us? From the cutoff, there's the flyaway that leaves three and a half years, like Revelation 12, right? 14. Daniel's tells us from the cutoff, which is about 10 and a half years, just like Psalms 90 and 10, about 10 and a half years. It tells us that the people of the prince that shall come, right? When, when, uh, when the beast comes back, there's going to be a flood when Satan is cast down, and then there's a war. And when this war is over, there's one more week, one more year, the 14th year, as it was in the days of Noah of Matthew 24. Let me show you how this all plays out. This, this two and a half days that are in the is that are prophetic as years playing out in the is to come. Watch this. This is from our brother Moses. Check this out. This is the picture that came up, and I loved it, man. Watch this. Why I still use the Oxford comma. With, it says, I had eggs, comma, toast, comma, and orange juice. This is what it would equal. To eggs plus toast plus orange juice. Without the comma before the word and, I had eggs, comma, Toast and orange juice. And what does he do? The picture is a picture of the orange juice poured on the toast because without the comma, there's no separation to say in addition to. It's like they're together. Hello. <laughs> I loved it. I thought that was such an awesome post. How, how fitting that that showed up in our, brother's, uh, in our brother's feed of whatever it was he was looking at. Because this is something we have taught on Many, many times here. You guys will recognize this from Revelation chapter 7. And you'll see how it ties in. In Revelation chapter 7, in verse 9, when the great multitude comes in, listen to what it says. It says that there would be those clothed with white robes, comma, and palms in their hands. So there's a multitude, a great multitude of people. Some are clothed with white robes and comma and palms in their hands. Now, some people might say, oh, they're the same people, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Nope. They, now, you could say, well, maybe, but we can biblically prove it <coughs> in the prophetic that there's a group with white robes and there's a group with palms in their hands. And how do we know this? Well, if we go to Revelation chapter 6, <clears throat> Let's go to Revelation chapter 6 real quick. 
And in Revelation chapter 6, we see at the sixth, at the fifth seal, um, those that were killed this is for the testimony of the Lord and that he would avenge them. And white robes were given to every one of them and told they had to wait for their fellow servants and brethren. Okay? They were given white robes. These are the ones that die in tribulation. Okay? Not the servants specifically, but people that are dying during tribulation. And they they came to believe in the Lord and, and committed over to him. But the ones with palms in their hands, check this out. <clears throat> it's the transfiguration story, or triumphal entry of Mark's, gospel, of Mark's gospel. Listen to this. When you go Luke, Mark, Matthew, these differences in the gospels, listen to this. You don't read this in Luke's. But you read it in Mark's, and you don't read it in Matthew's. So remember, we could see those who were, had, who were given white robes because they died in the midst of seals in the name of the Lord. And you had others with palms in their hands. And what is the picture of the triumphal entry in Mark? It's a picture. It's prophetically layered in a picture. That's why the difference of it between Luke, Mark, and Matthew this is a picture of the Lord coming at the end of the sixth year, which is the time of the start of the seventh year of seals. And when he comes, what does it say in verse 8 that it says in no other gospel? And many spread their garments in the way, and others cut down branches off the trees. Well, wait a second. Remember the seven, the second seven in, in uh, the story of the ark? When the dove came back in that seventh year and had a branch right the olive leaf which means branch plucked off look at what it says here and the other the others cut down branches off the trees and this branches is used one time only in mark exactly in the prophetic time frame picture of the seventh year of seals when the lord is returned and what did revelation say it said in chapter 7 that there were those with white robes, comma, and palms in their hands. These are those who died, and these are those who were alive still at his coming. Comma, and. A separation in addition to. It's pretty wild, isn't it? It acts, I love that one. It just, it blows my mind seeing that. Well, here's another one for you. Which connects, going back, to what we're talking about of this time with Christ when, when the Messiah is returned and there's this time where he gets cut off. We go to Daniel chapter 12. In Daniel chapter 12, in verse 7, it says, And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the rivers, when he held up his right hand and left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time, comma, times, comma, and a half. You see, I've talked about this many times, <laughs> pun intended, that there's no word and between this time and this times, but there is between times and a half. So you have a comma, no and, comma, and a half. It says, and he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people. When he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. When is it finished? At the end of 13 years, at the start of the 14th, when they see the Lord coming on the clouds as lightning from one end unto the other. As soon as it says in Revelation 10, as soon as the seventh trumpet begins to sound, the mystery is over. It's finished. Well, what does this say? Time, times, and a half. There's no end between them. It's one, comma, two, comma, plus a half. This is two and a half years. Watch this. Two and a half years. Well, what, what did we say here? That this is where Messiah is cut off, and that in the is, it was two and a half days approximately. In the is to come, we're saying it's going to be two and a half years. Two and a half days in the prophetic Days as years, two and a half years. Watch what happens. In, in Daniel chapter 12, it was two and a half years. 
But if we go to Revelation chapter 12, again, a piece we know very, very well. We go to Revelation chapter 12, and we see that when Satan has lost his battle in heaven and has been cast down, having lost his battle against Michael and his angels, Satan and his angels are cast down. This is now mid-trumpets time, the about ten and a half years, and what's going to happen? The pit's going to open, and the beast is going to come back, and he's going to be the son of perdition and goes into perdition, right? It's the first woe. The fifth trumpet is the first woe. And what does it say? It says he knows he has but a short time. It's two and a half years. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness. Uh into her place where she is nourished for a time, comma, and times, comma, and half a time. You notice the difference from Daniel 12? There's an and right here. It means in addition to. One plus two, that equals three. Plus a half, that equals three and a half. So what do we know? When Messiah gets cut off, Messiah gets cut off, and there's two and a half years of Satan here and him having his short time, and it starts by what? Revelation 12 tells us that it starts by him going after the woman with a flood from his mouth. He's going after her with a flood from his mouth. And what time is it? We know it's mid-trumpets. Ten and a half years in when the cutoff takes place. Well, if we go to Revelation 11, we see that, actually, if we go to Revelation 9, we see that the first woe, the star has fallen. What is the fifth angel sounding? It's the first woe. Revelation 12 said it was at the woe. And what happens? And he opened the pit. We go to Revelation 11, and what happens at the pit when it's opened? When the pit is opened, it says, and then the beast, in verse 7, and the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and then shall overcome them and kill them. Okay? But what does he do first? When the beast comes out of the bottomless pit, he makes war against them. So when Satan is cast down and the pit is opened, the beast that was, that was killed at the end of the sixth year of seals he was for 42 months. He is not. And then he's going to ascend out of the bottomless pit. And he's going to make war against the two witnesses for two and a half years. Satan knows he has but a little time. And how long would it be? It told us in Daniel that it would be time, times, and a half. Because there's no end, it's not one plus two plus a half. It's one, two plus a half. Meaning one, two, three, four, five and a half. That would be five and a half. One, two and a half. That's two and a half years. There's going to be the war that's two and a half years. And when he's cast down, he goes after them with a flood. And what did Daniel chapter 9 tell us would happen when Messiah was cut off? What did it say? When Messiah is cut off about ten and a half years in it says and the end thereof shall be with a flood what happens when satan's cast down and the pit is open he goes after them with a flood and then what happens it says unto the end of the war which means there's going to be a war and this war is going to end before this final week which is the final 14th year so how long does the flood and the war last? Daniel 12 told us two and a half years is how long Satan would have. So what do we see for Messiah? What do we see about his cutoff? Days as years. At Messiah's cutoff in the was of Daniel, revealing the is of when Christ came the first time, that cutoff equaled 
two and a half days. In the prophetic is to come, in an only year count from 2024, that would equal the spring of 2035, about 10 and a half years in, the equivalent of the 2 plus 33 of A.D. when Christ did fulfill the two and a half days. In the prophetic is to come, the two and a half years are the equivalent of the two and a half days, days as years. And what happens at the very end of those two and a half days as years when he's cut off and war is broken out against him? What happens at the end of that 13th year? You guys all know it, right? What happens? Well, something's going to happen before he returns because it would appear he was at war. When Messiah gets cut off, the flood goes after them and a war breaks out for two years, two and a half years. <coughs> what happens at the end of those two and a half years? Well, who was the one that, that's causing this war? Let's go look. We know from Revelation 17, right? The beast that, that's, that thou sawest was. Because in the second half of seals, right, the 42 months to the end of the sixth year is the was. And then he is not because when the Lord came on Zion, he destroyed him when he came with paradise at the end of the sixth year of seals. And then it says, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. Who do you think it is? The beast that was there then gets killed, so he is not. And then when Satan is cast down and the pit is opened, He's coming out of the pit. Then Satan flees them all off with a flood to scatter them like Revelation, uh, like Daniel 12 said. And the son of perdition, who is the beast, is going to rise up out of the pit. And now what will happen? Well, in the first half of trumpets, the city streets and temple got built, just like Daniel said. So we know in this first half of trumpets, trumpet judgments, the first three and a half of the seven and a half years of trumpet judgments, which is from the eighth year to the tenth and ten and a half years in, the city streets and temple were rebuilt. So when when the beast comes now out of the pit and goes into perdition, we know it's what we shared recently, which is Second Thessalonians chapter two, that the falling away first, then shall be revealed the son of perdition. This is the prophetic is to come of the Laodicean age of the end of days. We're in the Laodicean age now. But when the Laodicean age ends, at the moment of the pre-trib, the seven churches will play over again. And at the Laodicean age, at the ten and a half year mark of the entirety of tribulation, it will be the Laodicean age again. It'll be when Satan is cast down, the pit is opened, the beast comes back as the son of perdition from the pit and Messiah is now cut off and he goes and creates war against them for two and a half years. That is the same two and a half days as two and a half years. And when the son of perdition and this war breaks out for the final two and a half of the final three and a half years, right? Because there was three and a half years left. But it's only going to take the, the beast and the Satan and all them will only get two and a half. What does it say? There he is. He's come back. He was. He is not. And then he shall be at mid trumpets at the cutoff. And then what does it say? In Second Thessalonians 2 verse 8. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. And shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. When the Lord, after the two and a half years, and then there's the again that takes place, and it relates to the two witnesses, which are what? Three and a half days. Remember, the unfulfilled Matthew portion of after three days and three nights. 
will be fulfilled in the portion of the two witnesses at the end of those two and a half years at that cutoff. And then what happens? They stand up, they go to heaven, and then what happens? The Lord starts the 14th year. It even says immediately after, in, in Matthew 24, immediately after the tribulation of those days, as soon as the lips of Revelation 10, as soon as the trumpet blasts, as soon as it starts to sound, the seventh trumpet, it says the mystery is over. Why? Because the 14th year begins with the Lord coming feet down on the Mount of Olives. And when he comes on the Mount of Olives, we saw in Luke chapter 17, that when he does fulfill that final portion that he started the story with in 1724, when he comes as lightning from one end of heaven unto the other, when he comes in his day, when he comes as Matthew chapter 24 said in verse 27, only found in Matthew's, not in Mark or Luke's, we see that he says in verse 27 of Matthew 24, for as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And as you guys know from recent teachings and from old ones, this word coming is used four times in the Gospels, in any of the Gospels, and all four of them are used in Matthew 24 about his coming as lightning from one end to the other when he returns feet down at the start of the 14th year of tribulation. So you had what? Three and a half years? Only two and a half of them were the Satan and the beast, were for Satan, the beast, the false prophet. And then when the Lord, when that two and a half year battle is over, and then the Lord returns feet down on the Mount of Olives at his coming, it's at him coming as lightning from one end unto the other to then Zechariah 14, defeat all the enemies that came against them. And what did 2 Thessalonians tell us about what would happen at the end of that time after the son of perdition had his two and a half years during that war, then what does it say? Verse 8 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Same word. All of it relating to him returning feet down on the Mount of Olives as Matthew chapter 24, immediately after the tribulation of those days, he returns at the 14th year, feet down on the Mount of Olives, the 100th year of Abraham. Isaac is now born. And when he comes, what is it going to be? It will be, as we said at the beginning, it'll take us back to Matthew, the end of Matthew 24 where it will be as it was in the days of Noah that started with the 40 days of the Son of Man that played out the 7, 7, 7 in the entirety of the storyline. And then at the final year, the 49th year of the 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7 from the last Jubilee, it will be the 49th year for the days of Noah that will be one year and 10 days long. And when that's over, what happens? On the 10th day, the day of atonement, because when did it all start? At the fall time, because it is to the house of Judah this time. And when the seven years is over, or the 14th year is over, it will have been from the fall feast to the fall feast the whole way through. And 10 days later is what? From the true fall feast of trumpets to the true day of atonement 10 days later is exactly what scripture tells us comes next. When he will what? When he will sound the shofar of the final jubilee, the 22nd year in the big picture or the 14th year of the end of days to the 15th. Brothers and sisters, this is the revelation 
of the menorah. It is the revelation from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation. Seven easy, seven of seals, seven of trumpets. Final is the 22nd year. It is the revelation of the seven times seven. It is the final three. And when it really takes place is the final two, just as the story from the ark. It's revealed everywhere. Isn't that a wild one? You see how everything is connected? You see how it all tracks? How it all perfectly fits together without a glitch? Without trying to, to jimmy rig something in anywhere? What happens in that final year? What happens when, that, when the Lord deals with them in that final 14th year like Zechariah 14? When he comes as the Isaac, the promise. Well, in the 10th day, after that 14th year, which is the 49th year, the only one that has 10, ever, 10 extra days, to sound the shofar of the Jubilee, what happens? Those who fled into the wilderness on the wings of an eagle, they were gone for a time and times and a half. They were taken till the end of the 14th year. While the Lord was in this war for two and a half years and then returns feet down and destroys all of the enemies of Jerusalem, right? Of his people, destroys all of the enemies in that final 14th year. And then, when that 14th year is over, when that three and a half years is over, on the 10th day, the sound of the Jubilee, the, shof the shofar, is sounded. And all those that were taken on the wings of an eagle to a place protected will be brought back to receive their inheritance. To receive their promise. And what was their promise? The millennial reign of peace. The restoring of all of their lands to each of the tribes. Just as he told them would happen in Ezekiel at the end of 47 and all of Ezekiel 48. Brothers and sisters. I pray this blesses you. I, I pray you were able to track it, follow it, spend some time in it over the next few days and really seek and search it out. If you're newer and you haven't seen this before and really tracked into it, it's absolutely incredible. Just consider all of these parts and pieces was the same story. It was all telling us the prophetic revelation of the end of days. And it was shared by other brothers and sisters who have understood these things, who have tracked these things, who have studied and diligently sought them out as we've been doing for years in the Ministry Revealed Forum and through these teachings here. How powerful is that? Let us all finish strong, brothers and sisters, in these final, prayerfully few days that remain. I'm speaking to you from October 19th, 2024, and we have five to six days left. I think five. I pray we have understood it this time. You saw it with your own eyes. You could track it with your own eyes. This is the end of 70. It, it equals the time from Christ in the equivalent from the was to the is. We can show the count based on a session, not a session. We know it's fall time compared to springtime. It's all there. I believe we're here, guys. I really, truly believe it in my heart of hearts. And it's kind of freaky. <laughs> Let's be honest. We're talking about something that, that seems like a fairy tale. But it's the revelation of the word of God through the leading of the Spirit. The cherry on top, I believe, is now here. And the revelation is revealed. So let's finish strong. Let's keep seeking and searching. Let's keep sharing if we can. Let's help 
our brother in Uganda reach more people, get more things done. And let's stand before the Son of Man, prayerfully having been accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass, or to be ready when he returns from the wedding in Knox. I love you. God bless you. God bless your families always. See you shortly. Bye for now.